Well, thank you, Steve. Thanks very much for having me. Ask questions anytime. So feel free. So, you know, I, I can't, can't remember what happened. I went to someone's talk and they had a really cool title. So when Steve invited me, I'm like, I usually have this boring, like, healthy, unhealthy, cell to cell communication. And it's like, ooh, I'm excited. So I was like, can I think of something kind of fun? And I thought of that movie, like, look who's talking. And so that's how I got to this title. So if you're ever trying to capture people's attention, try and think of at least a little catchy thing at the front, because it's a lot more fun than that. All right, so our lab is interested in communication within skeletal muscle, in particular looking at crosstalk between the cells inside there. And so we think of muscle, and we always think of muscle fibers, but there's different cell types, blood vessels, satellite cells, other cells that uh, we're interested in, and we're really interested in applying it to uh, chronic disease, aging, obesity, and I'll show you some a little bit of data there and then a little bit of exercise data as well. And then we're also interested in how these things may alter the regulation of the small extracellular vesicles, also known as exosomes. The exosomes, and I'll show you some pictures, they're about 50 to 150 nanometers in size, and they contain microRNA, messenger RNAs, proteins, lipids, and so they are, a, we originally were thought to be a way for cells to get rid of things they didn't want. And they've learned since that time, which was probably 30, 40 years ago now, that they, these little vesicles actually are important for communication. And I'll show you some of the things that we think they're important about. All right, so in case, when I'm in a kinesiology group, it's really easy because everybody gets muscle. Right? If I go talk to someone who doesn't do muscle work or doesn't think about moving, I always have to make sure they understand why muscle is so important. Of course, we know it because muscle makes up a huge amount of your body weight, 30 to 40% of your, of your body mass. Also, it is the site in which we consume most of the oxygen during exercise, and it's the site where when you get a bolus of glucose or you eat a meal, most of that glucose is going to end up in the skeletal muscle. So it's important for moving and it's important for us regulating metabolism. All right, so just to kind of give you a nice cartoon of the, how I think of things or how we, I look at things. So here's a, uh, a cartoon I stole from Russ Heppel many years ago. Oh, sorry, wrong button. If that's the first and only time I do that, you will be surprised as me. Is, so here's a muscle fiber, real simplistic diagram. Here's mitochondria. Here are capillaries. Okay, so they are tiniest blood vessels. It's where the vast majority of all the exchange inside the muscle occurs. Oxygen diffusing from uh, hemoglobin out and down to the mitochondria where it's used to make ATP, of course, and then carbon dioxide could be picked up. And so it represents this potential barrier for diffusing of substances either in or out of the muscle fiber. And what we've seen is that when we quantify, this is one way we can quantify muscle capillarization, it's related to VO2 max. So if you want a high VO2 max, you gotta make sure you have enough capillaries, which to us suggests that while there are multiple pieces in the cascade of oxygen going from the environment all the way down to the mitochondria, that this is an important piece that could be regulating or being dysregulated in chronic disease. But the other thing we see too is, it also is tied to, so it's closely related to aerobic capacity, but it's also tied to you maintaining your muscle fiber mass. So this is a study we did um, where we were looking at young and older adult women, young women, college age, 18, 25-ish. Older women were all uh, 60 and older. 70, we had some 70 year olds, maybe one 80 year old. And what we saw was that if we looked at the relationship between muscle capillarization and muscle fiber size. So one of the things of course we're struggle with as we get older is we're gonna lose muscle mass. I've lost muscle mass, you guys haven't yet, but unless you start to really work hard at it, you lose, you've are, you're gonna lose some here quickly or in the near future. Or if you even do a lot of resistance exercise, there's going to be an age when you no longer can maintain your muscle mass. It's going to happen to all of us. But what we saw was that especially in the older women, 
capillarization is really closely tied to the size of the muscle fiber. So if you start losing capillaries, you have no choice but to start losing muscle fiber mass. And that's critically important because now you're, at, you're experiencing atrophy. If it's severe enough, you could be experiencing sarcopenia. And now you're going to really limit your movement, right? I always talk about, we talk about why is it so important to maintain muscle mass. It's important for things like chemotherapy treatment. So we always think about just moving around. It's important to get on and off the commode, right? So maintaining muscle mass as we get older is critically important. And we think capillarization plays a role in that. So if we're losing them, we're going to see more atrophy. And so finding ways or identifying ways to help us maintain that is going to be important and therefore an important regulatory piece. The other one, this is work from Steve Pryor's group out at Maryland, looked at in older adults, put them into an exercise training program, and tried to see what was regulating improvements in muscle insulin sensitivity. So, for those of you who think about insulin sensitivity a lot and those of you who don't, when, as I mentioned, when we get a meal or we drink a big sugary drink, most of that glucose is going to end up in your muscles. So Steve was looking at, we know exercise training improves muscle insensitivity. What are the factors that predict how insulin sensitive or how much improvement we'll see with exercise training? And what he showed was, oh, wrong button. Two. All right, muscle ca the people who had the greatest amount of muscle capillarization gain are the people who had the greatest improvements in muscle and ins insulin sensitivity. So if we want to use exercise to improve insulin sensitivity, we need to be doing things that can help us maximize the increase in muscle capillarization. And what it says to me too is, and I showed you from the earlier cartoon, there's a lot of communication potential there between the cells. And so let me give you a, this is an electron, uh, um, electron microscope picture of muscle. So over on the right, we've got cross-sectional. On the left, we've got horizontal. And what I want you to see is, so here's the muscle fiber, this big, this to this. This squiggly is a muscle capillary. It sits in, a, the capillary sit in grooves of the muscle. And they're actually squiggly because when they're squiggly, they're tortuous, they increase their surface area. So we tend to think of them as tubes, tube of fiber, tube of capillary, but the capillaries actually are tortuous and that tortuosity helps to increase the surface area available for diffusing, all right? And then we see different kinds of cell types. So now if we do it in cross section, what we see is, here's an endothelial cell here you can see it's kind of sitting in this groove. These are uh, nuclei here from the muscle fiber. So this is a muscle fiber here. Here's kind of this groove it sits in. But the other thing is they also are in really close proximity to satellite cells. Muscle satellite cells are of course important. We think of them lots when we talk about muscle injuries or when we talk about muscle hypertrophy. And so they play a role in repair and contribute to increasing muscle mass with resistance exercise. But I, do, I, I show this picture because I'm gonna talk about these three cell types. And I always want you to think, and I'll kind of keep, I kind of keep bringing this picture up, how close they are, right? A capillary is about seven to eight microns. So this, these are nanometer sized distances between those cells. And it makes sense to me that they might be communicating back and forth with each other, that they're not independent players, that this is actually a team that's actually trying to help each other out. All right, so that made us ask the question, does skeletal muscle, either the myofibers or the satellite cells, do they regulate endothelial cells? And in theory then, do they regulate muscle capillarization? But we also asked the question, do endothelial cells regulate the skeletal muscle? And I'll show you data that both of those things happen. And I'll show you data that shows when we have chronic disease-like conditions that it has a negative effect. So before we get going too far down the line, so I've shown you what capillaries look like. And if you want to make more capillaries with exercise training, you make about 20% more muscle capillaries. 
is how does that process work? So here we've got two capillaries. These are, endo, these are endothelial, these are pericytes here. And what we do is, so if you want to make more capillaries, the pericytes detach, we start to have um, permeability of the capillaries, and the endothelial cells come out of the capillaries, they start um, um, proliferating, so we have to make more endothelial cells, they have to be, be uh, proliferating, and then they have to be um, drawn to or migrating towards a specific center, all right? And they have to talk between the two capillaries, going towards one center, and then they have to form tubes. So I'm going to show you data here as we go along when we talk about endothelial cells. Does this event change endothelial cell proliferation? Does it change its migration? Does it change its ability to, cha to form tubes? Okay. And we historically had worked in this area where we had looked at this growth factor called vascular endothelial growth factor. We spent many years, we probably were looking at it for, we still look at it, don't get me wrong. But we spent a lot of time looking at it. And what we know about it is the prototypic angiogenic growth factor that gets secreted from cells. So it's a myokine, all right? Myokines are proteins, cytokines, what have you. They get released by muscle and have positive or negative effects. I think most of the time we think of it as positive effects. And what we saw with the VEGF was, um, and we put a probe in between muscle fibers. So we were able to use a probe, a microdialysis probe, that sticks in between the muscle fibers. It doesn't penetrate them. So it's looking at that tiny little space. Remember I talked to you about that tiny little space? It's sticking in there and it's, it's capturing proteins. So we could actually measure VEGF being released from the muscle at rest and then during exercise. And what we saw was that it goes up with exercise and that response is lower in older adults. And it explains a portion of the reduction in muscle capillarization that we see as you get older. So we've always had a long interest in understanding these myokines, this crosstalk, really thinking muscle to endothelial cell. But what we've now started to think about more, and we've really done most of our research over the last five or six years in, is these things called extracellular vesicles. All right, as I mentioned before, they're about the ones we're interested in are in the size range of 50 to 100 nanometers in size, really tiny. Um, as I mentioned, they've got, they're packaged with a bunch of things. Um, and it's been speculated that muscle, and muscle does produce them. Most cell types do produce exosomes at these small extracellular vesicles. And I'll interchange probably exosomes and small EVs throughout the talk. Um, and that they could event eventually be released by muscle and enter the circulation and have positive effects on other tissues. Right now though, we think most of the, most of the extracellular vesicles are probably retained within skeletal muscle. And if we looked at how all the EVs in your blood, maybe only like 5% of them are for muscle, whether it's at rest or exercise. So it's enough to make a difference, but it's not the majority of these circulating things in, in the circulation. So we've really focused then back on this paracrine question of what's going on inside the muscle itself. So a lot of times people ask us, have you ever measured them in the circulation? We haven't been interested, so we haven't done it. It's relative, I think it's relatively simple to do, um, but we just haven't ever done it. So this is some work that Yao, Yao Hui Nya did in our lab. He was a postdoc working in the lab. And he and I were talking one day, and we're talking about regulating capillaries. He goes, well, what do you think about these exosome things? And this is where being a person, if you do a good job listening, you actually have people give you really good ideas. So he was like, we should really look at exosomes. And I'm like, what are exosomes? He's like, they're these small little things, just the same things I explained to all of you, right? They're like 50 to 150 nanometers in size. They got all this packaging, right? I'm like, really? You think that's what we should try? He's like. Yeah, I want to try that. Okay, let's give, it a, let's give it a try. So the first thing we had to kind of figure out was, I don't know, can we capture them? Can we measure them? What do they look like? How do we know if we've got them? So there was a lot of conversations about how do we get started in this? And Yao Hui really did a great job leading these conversations. And the first thing we did in this project, we used C2C12 immortalized mouse 
muscle cells that we can turn into myotubes and cell culture. Okay? And the first thing we did then was, okay, we can culture these tubes, we can grow them, we can give them to myotubes, they're multinucleated. Well, if we're kind of interested in these EVs, shouldn't they be in the media from these cells? Sounds pretty reasonable. Okay, are they? So we had to you know, learn these new techniques, and lo and behold, when we went to an electron microscope and got a picture, we got these small EVs. Here's a 100 nanometer size, so these are about 100, 150 nanometers. And what we saw was these are markers for these EVs that while they're definitely expressed in muscle cells, we also found them in these vesicles, which to us said we've got what we we're looking for. It took us way longer to do that than my simple explanation, and I did very little of any of the work except to say, Yahweh, that looks good. Good job. But he did all this hard work, and you'll see, me, you'll see him pop up throughout our talk, and he's had a hand in, in so many things that we've been doing over the last six, seven years. So one of the things, yeah, we, we did was like, I, okay, so can we, all right, great, we got them. Hey, look at those, that's a great picture. I don't know, can we measure anything inside of them? And I'm like, what do you think we should measure? He goes, I think we should measure microRNA. We should measure what? MicroRNA. MicroRNA, 24, 26, nucleotide, base pair, small messenger RNA species that can many times, not exclusively, but many times, have an inhibitory effect. So if it's elevated, they'll essentially block translation or could lead to destruction of messenger RNA. So they're thought to be a negative regular of things. But then we said, okay, so can we measure what's in it? It's like, yeah, well, what should we measure? So we came up with a list of microRNA we should measure in these vesicles. And we came up, with, here's traditional muscle microRNA, and here's some microRNA known to be involved in angiogenesis. Oh, great. So if we looked at the skeletal muscle, we isolate microRNA from the skeletal muscle, we get a pattern that looks like this. And we said, so okay, well, what's in the vesicles? Well, not surprisingly, we do have these muscle microRNA in them, but what we see is much greater relative levels of the angiogenic microRNAs. So it told us two things. One, these could be participating in regulating angiogenesis. And two, there is some type of packaging going on here. Because if it was just a grab and go, you just took whatever's in the cytoplasm as you're building these EVs, and they just reflect exactly what's inside that cell, then these two relative relation, uh, expression levels should be the same. Right? This should look just like this, and it doesn't. So we also know that there's somehow selective packaging going on where some microRNAs are being um, expressed more or available more or, or higher content-wise inside these EVs. So then, the, so, and truly, like, we're sitting, like, I'm making this sound like we had this conversation all in, like, 10 minutes. This is like, have a conversation, hour, two hours, run experiments, two weeks, four weeks, whatever, come back, evaluate, conversation. So they never go quick, and I say that as you're thinking about your own studies. They all take time, and they take more time than your initial plan thinks, but stick with it. Because one of the questions that we said was, okay, awesome, we can measure them, we can capture them, we can measure stuff that's in them. What do they do? Do they actually, whatever we, we, we can measure here out of these uh, immortalized cells, these muscle cells, do they actually, are they able to get into endothelial cells? So what Yahweh did was we load, oh, loaded up some CM Dill, it's just a dye, loaded up um, the EVs with this dye, put them on endothelial cells, these are the nuclei from the endothelial cells, and what you see is, and we don't have the membranes here, these EVs could get inside endothelial cells. Okay, so we can measure them, we got some sense of what's inside of them, they seem to be able to find a way to put their content inside the endothelial cells, so what? <laughs> 
still haven't asked any questions about the physiology. So then we said, so what happens to these endothelial cells if we expose them to these EVs? If we grow them up, put a couple days where the EVs are present with the endothelial cells, and that's hard because we had did a lot of studies trying to understand how much muscle media will endothelial cells tolerate and how much media would muscle cells tolerate from endothelial cells. And what we found out was it's like a 50-50 mix. If you take muscle media and put on endothelial cells, they die. If you take endothelial cell media and put them on muscle cells, they die. So we always had to find ways to make sure everybody's happy. So what we could do was then, and I didn't show you where we just started with media, right? So we're like, well, does the media have an effect? Is it something in the media that has an effect? Is it VEGF that has an effect? Is it the EVs? But here I'm just showing you, we isolated EVs, and what we saw was endothelial cells, their viability goes up, that they proliferate more. So remember, proliferation, migration, tube formation. That's what we need to do to build capillaries. The cells migrate better, the endothelial cells migrate better, and they form tubes, more tubes. So all three steps in the angiogenic process are enhanced when we expose endothelial cells to EVs. So clearly they're regulating, they have the capacity to regulate endothelial cell angiogenic function. So then we ask, because like, I'm a VEGF guy. Like, I got promoted on VEGF. I became an associate professor because of VEGF. I became a full professor because of VEGF. I have to measure VEGF. We have to do that because that's me, right? Well, not here. So what we did was we said, okay, is there VEGF inside these EVs? Nope. I know, but maybe we just can't measure it. Maybe it's so low we can't measure it. Okay. Well, does it activate the VEGF receptors? Receptors get phosphorylated when there's VEGF around. So that's what we see here. We take endothelial cells, we expose them to VEGF, VEGF receptor gets phosphorylated in a time-dependent manner. Exosomes, nothing. So it's not VEGF. It's not that we're, VEGF is being transported inside those vesicles and doing something. And what we saw was they have distinct expression patterns, all right? So here, the exosomes will turn on things like IL-8 gene expression, whereas VEGF doesn't. VEGF will increase the expression of VEGF itself, that's a known function of it, but the EVs don't. So they're clearly distinct functions and they're gonna be complementary. So it's something unique that these EVs do. Okay, so we're pretty happy right now. We're like, hey, we got something. I still remember the first time we started doing this, I had to drive down here, I can't remember, Dr. Hubel and I were, we were gonna talk about something uh, science related. Um, and I still remember driving down thinking like, oh my gosh, I think I got something. So we were pretty excited. So I still remember driving down I-65 and being pretty excited about it. So then we started to ask questions about how important are these EVs? Where are they important? How do we, what happens if we make cells um, unhealthy, right? So I just showed you healthy. What happens if we make them unhealthy? So this is work that Zach Hediger did when he was a master's student in the lab. Zach's gone on to um, do his PhD with uh, uh, Esther uh, dupont verstig and died at the University of Kentucky and now is a postdoc in Fabricio um, Ambrosio's lab at Harvard. And then Chris Cargill, and you see Chris a lot here. Chris did his master's and PhD in the lab at Purdue and is now in Brad Nindel's lab as a postdoc at Pittsburgh. So we then said, so what happens if satellite cells, what happens if muscle cells, in particular satellite cells, become senescent? And senescence is inability to replicate. Does that have a negative effect? We know that in obesity, these satellite cells can become senescent. And when cells become senescent, they actually communicate a senescent secretory process, right? There is a um, set of proteins that they secrete that can negatively impact cells around them. So we question, are EVs part of this 
senescent secretory pathway. So the first thing we did was we said, well, can we make muscle satellite cells senescent? And we can. We expose them to hydrogen peroxide, and they stop proliferating. Awesome. We now have senescent cells. Now what we need are EVs from senescent cells. So we then measured the EVs. We captured them. This is uh, nano tracking. What it allows us to do is to count and size EVs. Because one of the things is maybe the EVs change. Maybe we get more of them or less of them. Maybe we get bigger ones or smaller ones. And what we saw was that if we look at the size range for exosomes, we get an almost doubling or a little bit more of these EVs. So senescent satellite cells will double the number of EVs they release into the media. All right, maybe that's good. Maybe that's bad. All right, and what we see is they, they contain a number of different um, proteins as well as um, different gene, ex gene uh, messenger RNAs, all right? Oh, and this is from the cells themselves. And what we see in the senescent cells is they ramp up. This is the machinery to build EVs. And senescence ramps up the machinery to produce more EVs. So it could be just that the EVs are there and they get released. But what we're showing is it actually turns on the machinery to make more EVs. Okay? So we felt confident that, we're, that senescence was driving EV production. And then we took those EVs and we put them on endothelial cells. First thing we found was senescent EVs from senescent muscle cells make endothelial cells senescent, right? So this communication of senescence can start to propagate. We see lower, we see more senescence, we see impairments in proliferation, and we see impairments in, this is a wound healing, it's an assay of migration, we see lower migration. So taking the EVs from senescent cells has a negative impact on endothelial cells. It makes them senescent, they don't proliferate, and they don't migrate very well. All bad things. All right? And so what it says is that if you have this communication going on, you need all your partners to stay healthy. That if we find something that's dysfunctional, endothelial cell dysfunction, which I'll show here in a sec, or satellite cell dysfunction, that will have a negative impact cascading event that can impact negatively the partners in this team. So Chris then said, well, okay, so making satellite cells unhealthy makes endothelial cells unhappy. What happens if we make endothelial cells unhappy? What impact does that have on muscle cells? So we just kind of reversed the, ran the question in the opposite direction. And so what we did was, Chris exposed, he incubated endothelial cells in normal glucose and high glucose media, replicating what we see in obesity, diabetes, aging, all right? And when you do that, what you start to see is, if you take the media off the endothelial cells and put them on to satellite cells, those satellites don't, don't proliferate as, as well. So if we have dysfunctional vasculature, it impairs satellite cells' ability to replicate. And we see that here, whether we're doing, however we're trying to quantify EDU, which gets incorporated into new proliferating cells. What we see is that if we look at the total number that we get here, that by six days of incubation, we have fewer cells. The cells reduce some of their cell viability. Their meta is metabolically active. And what we see is that it looks like when we take the media off of endothelial cells that have been incubated in high glucose, and we take that media and put it with satellite cells, that it starts to limit cell cycling. Cycling one's involved in cell cycling, mitosis, all that good stuff, right? And it doesn't actually impact the satellite cells by apoptosis. So it's not that they're dying, they're just not replicating. Because right? if we have more cells, well, we want to know why there's more cells. And it's because they're not replicating and not that they're just dying. So clearly we're seeing crosstalk between the major players here in that tiny little space that I showed you. All right? So that's one thing. But one of the things we want, right? So if you have an injury, 
your satellite cells become activated. And they will fuse in the injured fibers, repair, you'll see you have a repair process going on, contribute nuclei, and reform tubes, right? Because what we don't want is a whole bunch of damaged muscle. That happens in things like uh, muscular dystrophy, some muscular dystrophies you see, constant um, remodeling of muscle cells. And so our question was then, does dysfunctional high glucose incubated endothelial cells impact the ability of these satellite cells to form tubes? But they have to do a few things too, right? Just like endothelial cells have to migrate and do things, we also need to see do they, how do these cell, how do the satellite cells perform when they're co-incubated in this endothelial cell high glucose media? And what we see is that they don't fuse as well. So if you have an injury and you have some type of vascular dysfunction, the speed at which you're going to be able to repair is going to be reduced. All right? And what we really started to see was that we really are impairing the ability to get incorporated into tubes. Same tube sizes when they're there, okay? And we don't have bigger tubes, but every nuclei has to support a greater volume of muscle cell um, um, volume area. So clearly, dysfunctional endothelial cells negatively impacts our muscles' ability to repair and, and um, form tubes. So Chris also then look, has done a couple of things, and I'm running a little longer than I intended, so I'll try and keep us moving. Keep us all awake if I can, too. So Chris then looked at what are some of the differences between fiber types. We know oxidative muscle fibers have more capillaries than glycolytic. And this is a project that came out of the pandemic. So Chris was, had the wonderful fortune of being a doctoral student who started right before the pandemic and then got caught just like all of us in the pandemic. And so one of the questions we ran into was, what are you gonna do, right? Because we're not in the lab. So Chris started just going through all these small data sets we collected. And one of the things Chris noticed was, we had, all, we had already shown in Yahweh's work that oxidative, muscle releases more EVs than glycolytic does. And we've known, and this is every, I mean, this is well known, this is just some example of when we've done this type of data collection. Soleus muscle, which has more type one fibers, has higher capillarization than plantaris, which is more glycolytic. So Chris said, well, maybe these EVs are explaining fiber type related differences that we see inherently in, in muscle. So, we took some white muscle, some glycolytic muscle, and some oxidative muscle from mice. We isolated the EVs. Here's their pictures. Here's our markers. And what do we see? Yes, oxidative muscle produces more EVs than glycolytic muscle does. So then if we take um, the EVs from the different muscle types and put them on endothelial cells, what happens? Well, what we start to see is that we start, to, oh, dang, we start to see differences between glycolytic and oxidative muscle. We see fewer tubes, the tubes aren't as long, the cells don't migrate as well, right? So oxidative muscle is, has more capillaries in part because the EVs it's producing are more angiogenic. And so working with Dr. Hubel, Chris came down a few days, two days, week, something like that. And we had done uh, microRNA seq. So what do you do is you take, you isolate all the microRNA and you send it over and they tell you all the different microRNA are in there. And you get a list, a huge list of microRNAs that were in the EVs. So then you have to figure out like, is there a coordination here? What does this all mean? You have so much data, you can't figure it out. So Dr. Hubel helped us identify that doing what's called pathway analysis. You take all the microRNA, you tell them how many of each species you have, put it in the, put it in the program, none of which I've ever run either. I've never done these cell culture things. I, never, I don't do any of this. I get to talk to you about it. It's the fun part. So that's the fun part of it all, right? 
So what we saw is one of the things we saw, and this is comparing glycolytic to oxidative, green is going down. We always think of green as good. Green in pathway analysis means down regulation. So compared to oxidative, glycolytic down regulate the VEGF pathway. And I told you, I love VEGF. It paid for my kids to go to college. I love VEGF. So when we saw this, we're like, hey, let's see what happens. But one of the things pathway analysis does is it says, if I take those EVs and I put them on another cell type, what's going to get turned on in that cell type? Okay. So if we have the EVs, what in the endothelial cells gets turned on or turned off? Or what's different? And that's what we saw. VEGF is down, is lower in the glycolytic. And that's what we saw here. Here's VEGF gene expression. It's lower in the glycolytic. Here, these are the receptors for VEGF, and you can see that they also are lower in the glycolytic. So it clearly is communicating an angiogenic phenotype. All right. The other thing we looked at was, we noticed is that when we put these EVs on endothelial cells, it also phosphorylates this protein called endothelial nitric oxide synthase, which makes nitric oxide. And so we also then looked at what impact do these EVs have on NOS? And we see that oxidative EVs phosphorylate NOS. It increases gene expression and increases the phosphorylation. And then when we block it with L name, we start to see the differences between glycolytic and oxidative now have been removed. So some of what we see is a VEGF related mechanism, and VEGF does activate ENOS as well. And that the differences between oxidative and glycolytic now appear to be reduced when we block the nitric oxide synthase pathway. So showing us that EVs play a role through multiple pathways. All right, so Chris then, being a really productive graduate student who I was extremely fortunate to work with. I've, all, I've been fortunate with all the graduate students who have worked with me. He then said, and we work with Jeff Brault over at IU School of Medicine, is we overexpress PGC1, because we know PGC1 regulates oxidative phenotype, mitochondria, and it can regulate VEGF. So what happens if we overexpress PGC1 in muscle cells? What happens? So what we see is that when we overexpress PGC1, so the question being, well, what's different between oxidative and glycolytic muscle? Well, one of it is PGC1. So is, it P, is the difference we see a PGC1-related mechanism? So when we incubate the, uh, when we've overexpressed um, PGC1, what we see is greater endothelial cell proliferation, right? No difference in the migration. We get more tubes, longer tubes, and the cells have more metabolic activity. So we clearly see that PGC1 is a piece that could be communicated through EVs. Okay. So then we looked a little bit further to say, well, how is it doing it? One of the things we see being passed or being changed when we get exposed, the endothelial cells get exposed to EVs, is there some differences in some of the um, mitochondrial regulatory enzymes, but also some of the um, reactive oxygen species, um, dismutases, and ways in which we can um, 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 handle an increase in reactive oxygen species. And so what Chris did then was he said, if we pre-treat endothelial cells with EVs, does it improve their ability to handle being exposed to oxidative stress? And so what he showed was, if, or produce oxidative stress. So when we pre-treat EVs, we reduce the amount of ROS that they will produce, all right, with PGC1 EVs. And that has a positive effect in the redox status of the endothelial cells, which might be one of the reasons by which PGC1 may be working to improve endothelial cells. Okay, kind of went a little faster there. My apologies for that. Am I doing okay? I'm getting a drink of water. Questions? I get paid the same amount, one question or no question, so. I'm not getting anything, so, yeah. So I'll ask a quick question. So 
satellite cells during when they become senescent. Yep. They increase the release of the EBCs. Yep. They also release the EBCs when they're not senescent. They also do, yes. Okay. Do you know if the microRNA uh, looks different between when they're senescent and not? They do look different. We were really, in that study, we were really looking at the messenger RNA, and they definitely have a different messenger RNA profile. And the messenger RNA profile from the senescent, from the EVs from senescent satellite cells is more inflammatory. We see more TNF alpha being produced, um, which we think is part of that role, which I didn't show you here. So what about exercise? We like exercise. So this is some work here. Again, here's Xiaohui. A lot of this work was really led by Ron Garner. But uh, Jessica Solfis and Jesse Weiss had a big part of it. And if you haven't ever been to the Purdue campus, that's Neil Armstrong. His, his statue is across the street from my office. If you come to my office and visit me, you can look out my window and you can see Neil Armstrong. All right. So one of the things Ron did was we looked at how does exercise, does exercise regulate biogenesis of EVs? So we took, we took individuals, we had them exercise, and then um, about an hour after exercise, we pulled, we did a pre-exercise biopsy, a post-exercise, but we had them do two things. One was we had them ride a bike, and then right after they rode the bike, we had to do one-legged resistance exercise. Because we wanted to see, at this point, we don't know what happens, right? We have no idea. So our thought was, well, let's do the aerobic exercise. That probably works. But maybe it's not enough stimulus. So let's also do the resistance exercise, and then we get to do three biopsies on everybody. Bonus, right? So we didn't see a lot of change in the um, EV marker. So we were looking in the muscle to say, so if you have EVs and you exercise and the EVs get released out of the muscle, then you should have less of their proteins inside the muscle. So that's kind of our thinking was here. And we really didn't see a whole lot. But then we did where we did um, resist, just resistance exercise. So we did um, pre-biopsy, a 15-minute biopsy, and a three-hour biopsy. And what we see is we do start to see some differences in EV marker proteins in muscle, a little bit different time cores. And what it suggests to us is probably we missed some of the times of when the best time is. We didn't do a time course. We really struggle with like what would be the right time, um, how many biopsies did we want to do. But there is some suggestion then that we are potentially releasing EVs, and we see that with this Alex protein. So it clearly is down-regulated, or there's less of it after exercise. So it's a, you know, cells are really nice because we can take any time point we want, right? And with people with biopsies, it's like, how many can you do? The most we've ever done in one study was six in a day. We did that once. I'm okay if we never do that again. Because by this, like, the last time you're there, okay, after the first one, people don't like you. After the sixth one, I think they convinced your family not to like you anymore. But they were awesome. We've had awesome subjects who have really allowed us to try and investigate some of these questions. But the other thing we did too is we did some electrical simulation in, in our cell culture model. And what we saw is that it looks like we might be getting an increase in this Alex protein, this marker for EVs, in the media. This is what muscle uh, myotubes look like in cell culture. If you're wondering like, what does it look like, that's what it looks like. It's not very exciting, but it's really neat. I can't do that either, just so, we're, just so we're square. I do the biopsies. I could do Western stuff. I just don't do it anymore, and I'm not the cell culture guy. But besides that, I do a lot. But I get to talk to you guys. That's what the fun part is. So I appreciate everybody who I've gotten a chance to work with because they really advanced our lab and our science. So we think that maybe it may be released, like we can actually start to look at what's regulating the release of it in a controlled environment such as the cell culture, but we get a fair amount of variability there, so we're still kind of working our way through how would we really do that. And it's kind of funky. All right, so I think the last thing I'm gonna show you is a study that Sheila Evans and Brian Sullivan
Sheila uh, was a master's student in our lab. She's now a nurse. Brian was a master's PhD student in the lab. He is now working with Don Lowe up at the University of Minnesota. I mention these people because those are postdocs you could get to, right? These are really good people that we know who are always looking for really good people. And they can really help accelerate your careers. And they're always looking for good people. So it's not anything to do with me. It's all because of the students and all the hard work they do. But again, working with Dr. Hubel, what we did was we exercised obese people. We did a pre one week exercise biopsy. Then we did concurrent exercise training, again, because we don't know what works with training. So we had them do seven days of aerobic work and three days of resistance exercise every other day. Just to see if we could put enough load to start to see changes in EVs or start to see changes in the microRNA. So we captured the EVs, we got the microRNA out, we sent it off for RNA-seq, and we, again, Brian worked with Dr. Hubel to do pathway analysis. We came up with two things we, we identified which were important. One is that obesity seems to target both inflammation and growth. So these EVs predict that whatever they're going to be going to, they will cause inflammation, so we've already talked about transferring of senescence properties. They will cause inflammation, and they're going to be pro-growth. And with exercise training, the big thing we took home was, after seven days, we start to lower the inflammatory pathways. So exercise in individuals will lower the inflammatory communication signaling that the muscle is pushing out towards other cell types. So we always talk about exercise being anti-inflammatory, and we think the EVs are part of that anti-inflammatory communication with exercise training. All right, so skeletal muscle produces these EVs. They're important for uh, angiogenesis. Oxidative stress and senescence of satellite cells can have an impact on EV release and EV's ability to promote angiogenesis. Hyperglycemia can impact satellite cells. Endothelial cell hyperglycemia can impact endothelial cells. Obesity and exercise training can alter EV microRNA in a content that's either obesity inflammatory and exercise anti-inflammatory. And it looks like acute exercise will cause the release of these, but it's really hard to do because even when we get the EVs here, I talked about getting them from biopsies, what we do is we take the biopsy, we mince it all up, and we leave it sit for 24 hours. Because they start out inside the muscle, and we need to get them outside the muscle, so we have to give it time. So it's really hard for us with exercise to say, well, I can just measure them any time. We can't use our microdialysis because they're too big, so uh, we're still trying to identify ways that we can actually do the exercise. And then my collaborators, which I couldn't have never done this work without, Dr. Hubel, Dr. Brault, Dr. Kwong, Dr. Shanahan, and Dr. Stout up at Purdue. Um, and then my current research team, London Burton, Linda uh, Adiamo, and Ivan Alonzo. Um, these are pictures before they started working in my lab. I promise you now, after you work in my lab a little bit, you smile a little bit more. So please don't hold me accountable for their non-smiling effects. I think these were like their visa pictures or something. Maybe their passport pictures. But they're actually wonderful to work with as well, and I'm excited they just started this, this year. So. With that, uh, in our funding, as mentioned before, um, and I appreciate everybody's attention. Thanks. <laughs>